we'll start from the current slide. All right, let's talk about where we are, where we're heading, how we're going to get there, that type of stuff. Okay, let me start by this. In this, one of my best classes, of course, of all time, I only have one UNO paper turned in. Please get your papers done. We're running out of term. When is the last day? Huh? When is the last day? When is it? That's not the question, is it? No. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we have classes next week, which are the 17th and 19th. <coughs> and then the following week is the 24th and 26th. Okay? And then the week after that is the final exam. Okay? Now that's my memory. I hope I've got it right. Okay? Now. Probably got three more weeks. Yeah, but not three full weeks. The finals, I don't think, go the full week. I think it's just uh, two full weeks, and then I can't remember what day the final is on. Uh, actually, you may be right now that I think about it because we didn't start until a Thursday. So we may have. Okay, you're right. We probably have. I think that's right now that you say that. We have next week, which is 17th and 19th, and then the following, which is the 24th and 26th, and then I think the 31st of July is the last day of class, and then the final is on the Thursday, the whatever that day in March is, March 2nd, I believe it is. I mean, goodness gracious, August 2nd, August 2nd. I believe. I think that's how it runs. So you're right. I think we have two and a half weeks of classes after today, okay, and then a day of finals. So that would be it. Okay, and actually we're in pretty good shape as far as moving along. We missed our field trip to Sanford, which basically would have killed almost the whole day. So that put us up, up to we're actually ahead of schedule of where I normally am at this time, which makes me wish we had had chapter uh, 22 included, which was the atmosphere, but it's not in your little books, is it? So we can't do it because it's not there. I'll take some time talking about it this time, uh, not everything about the atmosphere, but at least some of the stuff about clouds and stuff. Okay, <clears throat> so last class, we finished chapter, what was that, chapter 20, okay? We did the lab that went along with chapter 20, okay? That was topographic maps, and, but that's <laughs> all we had time for. So today we start chapter 23, and we'll do chapter 23 just about all day long, okay? We'll go, but I'll stop no later than 3 o'clock. I want to probably stop a little before 3, uh, to give everybody time to do uh, the test, which will start at or maybe a little before three. Okay? Um, then, I don't know for sure if we're going to finish the chapter in that time. I'm thinking not. Uh, okay. Justin's here. Um, I imagine we'll have a little more chapter left to do, and that will then be Tuesday of next week is my guess. Now we should finish the chapter Tuesday of next week, chapter 23. That means we'll try to set up to do the lab for it, which is the visit to the Channel 13 weather station, Thursday of next week. Does that work for everybody? Uh, there are only five people here. That would be okay with you if we, I don't know that we can. I've got to arrange it with Jerry Tracy and, and his crew there. Uh, to see, but I, I think we'll probably be able to, that's what I'm going to shoot for anyway. Thursday of next week, have that lab. That then leaves the following week to do chapter uh, 24, which is the last chapter we're going to do, Earth's Waters, and between Tuesday and Thursday of that week, we should come pretty close to finishing everything there. Now, when is it you have to go, is it Friday of the, the third Okay, yeah, so yeah, we'll be through with everything by Thursday uh, of that week. So uh, so what we'll do is have the uh, 
lectures on chapter 24, and then we'll do the lab for 24, which is just a paper lab. We'll do you'll use your book for that, and then uh, after that we'll have the uh, final exam on that Thursday, and and that'll be it. And the final is really short and really easy, so I'm thinking probably let's maybe try to have pizza that day. Would that be all right? Try to shoot you for that day. Okay? That'll be Thursday the second. Okay. But well that's a ways off yet. Alright, any questions about where we are or where we're headed? Okay. Well let's get started in chapter twenty three, which is weather and climate. Now the picture on this is somewhat similar, but a slightly different <coughs> picture from the one that's in your text. I wouldn't want to be on that sailboat right there, right there, or even this little boat right there. That looks like a major storm coming in, especially for a sailboat, because that to me is a sailboat. Uh, I'd be heading to shore really fast, fast as I can get there, because that is a major uh, weather maker, it appears. All right? Weather and climate, and we'll do them in that order. The core concept here. <laughs> Weather and climate, okay. Um, glad I left my windows up today. Yesterday I left them cracked. Today I said, they said we might have showers, and I didn't, so I'm glad of that. Okay. As in just about everything in physics, we get just about all of our determining stuff from the sun. Solar radiation drives the cycles in the Earth's atmosphere. And some of those cycles determine weather, and then climate determined over a long period of time. So climate as well as weather. Now, we're going to get to the difference of that. Weather is what's happening today, right? That's weather. Climate is what the broad, uh, over time type deal has been. You know, uh, what has been the pattern for a long period of time. Now this is a pretty decent shot. I don't think that's in your book either. Uh, this is from an older edition. Uh, can y'all pick out what that is? Pretty much that's the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. This is the Florida right here. Here is somewhere <laughs> over here is Louisiana. I think it's on the cloud cover, so you can't really tell. This is probably Texas, maybe down in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, so that may be Mexico too. This underneath these clouds is the island of Cuba, I think, somewhere in there, and then some other islands there. So there's the, a um, satellite shot of basically the Gulf of Mexico. We're right up here somewhere, okay? Um, or we wouldn't have been back then, but we're up. Okay, there's the coast of Florida, Georgia, Savannah, somewhere right around there. So, so there's a uh, picture, and it indicates um, if I think you're actually seeing the the effect of wind on the Gulf of Mexico by seeing the the uh, I don't <coughs> not actually waves there are all the bigger thing swells. Swells that have developed over, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> over the Gulf of Mexico, and certainly the cloud cover here and here and there, a little bit here, more clouds up here. Uh, so this is an indicator <coughs> of the weather that's happening at the time. You can't tell for sure, but it's a pretty good indicator. Now, where do we begin in talking about weather? As we said, the sun, solar radiation drives just about all of this. So, let's start with the hydrologic cycle. How many chapters have had cycles in them? The rock cycle, you know, the uh, the cycle of plate tectonic. Yeah, I mean, just about every chapter has talked about uh, the principle of uniformity. What was, uh, what's, what's happening now is the result of what happened before. What um, happened before is determining what's happening now. I mean, it's just, it's all a big cycle. 
including the hydrologic cycle. Now, what does hydrologic mean? It means it's referring to what? Water. Hydrologic. Hydrate. You know, that's water. From? Water is basically hydrogen oxide, isn't it? H2O. So the hydrologic cycle. Now, how does this begin? Well, where's the chicken, where's the egg? Where does it begin? We don't know. Let's start with the ocean. The vast majority of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean waters. Okay? So let's start there. That solar radiation coming in from the sun heats the water in the ocean, evaporates that, the water goes up into the atmosphere. Somewhere up there, it gets cool enough that it forms clouds. Okay? The clouds are moved by winds. Now, the winds are caused by two things. Number one is the spin of the Earth. That's partly responsible for it. But also, winds are caused by solar radiation, you know, getting uh, the, the, the things moving there. Okay? So, the winds that move the clouds, and some of these clouds, well, we'll talk about that later. But some of these clouds make it all the way to land, and when they hit land, they may hit something that cools them even more, and then the precipitation falls out. So the evaporation happens over the ocean, precipitation happens over both ocean and land. The water comes out of the clouds, falls onto the land. Now, there, and we're going to talk about this more in the next chapter, we hope that much of that moisture goes into the soil, okay? That's how we raise our crops and feed ourselves and that type of thing. But in the long run, it ultimately is going to find its way back downstream to streams, to rivers, to basins, to whatever, lakes, and ultimately the water gets back to the ocean again. That's the hydrologic cycle. Now there are shortcuts and pitfalls, there's other things in between, but this is basically what's going on. Water leaves the ocean, evaporates, causes the color radiation of the sun, moves into the atmosphere, into clouds, the clouds get moved over land, the, the clouds cool, the precipitation comes, hits the land, and again, there can be shortcuts and detours and stuff on the land, but ultimately that water makes it back to the ocean. Okay? So, trans Evaporation from the ocean, step one, transportation through the atmosphere, step two, condensation, precipitation, step three, and return to the ocean, step four. Many smaller sub-cycles, like some of these clouds, it will rain on the ocean, okay? So it never makes it to land. Others, like we said, you may have a sub-cycle of the um, rain, going into the soil, going into groundwater. It may stay there for years, decades, centuries, millennia maybe, I don't know. And then ultimately, though, it will make its way back to uh, the ocean. Or it goes into a glacier. And it may be in a glacier for thousands of years, or five years, or sometime like that. But ultimately, it will melt and go back downstream until it hits the ocean. So there can be very much short circuits and some pretty long circuits <laughs> too. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the clouds and how clouds form. Um, the first statement here, clouds form when air masses are cooled to their dew point. Actually, the last time I was home, I was talking with my older brother, who basically did economics and that kind of stuff. He said, I never have understood what they mean by dew point. And we got to talking about it. What do we mean by dew point? Anyone have a clue? Yeah. Oh, that's, give it a shot. Okay, actually, it's a temperature. It's the temperature. All right, let, time out. Let's go backwards a little bit. If I were to uh, put a pot of water over a heating element in here and start heating that water, OK, 
okay? That water as it heats, it gets more energy, and finally some of those molecules break away. It's no longer liquid water, it's now gaseous water. It's now water vapor. Now, if I had lots of pots and lots and lots and lots of pots on heating elements evaporating in here, at some point, this air is what we call saturated with water. Okay? And then you'll see droplets of water. In fact, when I come in first thing in the morning uh, to this classroom, because the AC has been on, I don't know when they turn it on, but it, it's on when I come in. Those windows have water droplets on the in or outside. I don't know if I went or go over the sea. It's not like it's rained on them like you see now. It's actually like your mirror in the bathroom after you've taken a shower. It's got water fogged all over. Okay, why? Because the air at any given temperature, it can hold so much water. So it's moisture. Okay? But when you exceed the amount that it can hold, it starts coming out. Okay. That point, that temperature at which the air can hold no more water is called the dew point because then it starts doing it. It starts crossing. It starts uh, uh, condensing out of the air. Okay? So, um, outside, just a few minutes ago, it was raining. Now that basically meant we were very close to the dew point. We may not have been down here on the surface, but up there where the clouds were releasing that moisture, they were at the dew point. It may have been quite a bit cooler up there, but the clouds couldn't hold the water anymore because the air was so cool, the water condensed and came out. That's what the dew point is. That temperature at which the uh, water can no longer be held in the air. Now, Dew point is a temperature. Dew point depends on temperature. Right now, I'm guessing it's about 90 degrees outside. Would you say that's a safe guess? Well, maybe not since the rain, but before the rain. About 90 degrees, right? Give or take. Yeah. Okay. Now, at 90 degrees, the air can hold an awful lot of moisture. Okay. In fact, here in the southeast, on those days in summer when it's up there in the 90s, usually it's almost unbearable because usually the humidity is way up because we live in the southeast. Now, if you're out there in the desert around Phoenix, Arizona or somewhere, <coughs> it may be 120 something, but not really feel any worse than it does here at 95 because that air is a very dry air, okay? Because you're in the middle of the desert. There's not much moisture in the air. In fact, the houses out there usually have water supplied to their air handling system to add moisture to the air, okay? Uh, whether it's uh, adding heat to the, you know, if it's in wintertime, they're heating the air, they surely need the moisture then, or in the summertime when it's they're cooling the air, they usually still add moisture. They have humidifiers in their air conditioning air handling systems. Here in the southeast, every air refrigeration or air conditioning system I know about is pulling moisture out of the air because you're cooling the air and actually the moisture is coming out. In most of your air conditioning systems, somewhere outside, you'll see a drain tube. And that's the condensate tube. Okay? The system we have in our upstairs, they have a drain pan underneath and it collects the water, but then it evaporates again into the attic, because the attic is quite hot. Uh, the house we built over in Georgia, the air conditioning unit sits on the south side of the house, um, sort of south uh, western, a little bit, mostly south. And when the air conditioner is running, you can see water coming out of that tube just about all the time. So my wife, saw that, and back when we just first built the house, she said, let me put some mint there, okay? It'll always get moisture when it needs it in the summertime because the air conditioner is always going to be running. So she put a couple of pots of mint there. It's all over the place. Now, it just loves it there. It's 
So on the south side, it gets plenty of sun and plenty of moisture. And it just, uh, it, you, we're mowing the mint down sometimes. Smells so good, you know, and it's a really good place to mint too because you've got condensation coming out of that too. Anytime the AC is on, water is coming out because we're pulling water out of the air because the air outside, 90 degree air, can hold a lot of moisture. Inside, we're dropping that to say 68, 70, something like that. It's 20 degrees difference in air temperature. It can't hold as much moisture. So the moisture comes out and the condensate pulls it away and brings it outside. And waters are meant for us, okay? So, that's the dew point. Inside the dew point was, well, the dew point is that temperature at which the air can't hold any more moisture. That's going to be, at warmer air, the dew point is going to be much higher. Cooler air, it will be much lower. <coughs> now, generally, when air moves up, okay, now let's picture. Let's go back to this picture. Okay, when the ocean's sitting out there under the sun, okay, and it's evaporating water, okay, that is at pretty high temperatures, and it goes up. Warm air rises, carrying the moisture with it, okay? That was the chimney effect. Um, it has several names for it. One name, the technical name, is convection. Warm air rises, cool air comes down. Okay. Now, did any of you or your moms, uh, grandmoms, someone have that clear pots and pans made out of glass? And it was usually sort of a, a tannish or a bronzish type color, but you could see through the pots. It was called vision wear when they came out with it. They don't sell it much anymore. But back probably a few decades ago, it was sort of a new popular thing. And I can't remember if mom or my wife had a set of vision wear. And when you boiled the water in the pot, you could see the water. You could look down in any pot and see the water bubbling up. You can't, but this one you could see from the side, and you would see the hottest part of the eye. You know, it would heat up more there, and you see the water go up, and then it reaches the top, cool off, and go down the side because the sides were cooler than the middle and you would see the water doing this kind of motion all the time. Hot water moving up, cold water moving down, hot water moving up, and after a while it was boiling and it was rolling all over the place. That's convection, okay? And that's where the air is. Usually, the upward movement of air, when air heats, it, it warms, it goes up, and as it goes up, it usually cools. <coughs> Why is that? Well, I can remember when I was a little boy and I would see the snow on the mountains or pictures of that, we didn't live anywhere near the mountains, and I would think, why have the mountaintops got snow on them when they're closer to the sun than we are down here, you know? And it didn't make any sense to me why, you know, it was cooler on top of the mountain than it was down here. Part of the reason of that is the air is denser down here and the higher up you go, the air gets less and less dense. So there's less friction you know, and stuff like this between the air molecules. They're not bouncing around as much. The temperature is lower. Uh, the other thing is more of the sun rays have been deflected back into the atmosphere and not cooled as much. So there's a lot of the Earth's atmosphere acts like a blanket too. And the further down, snuggled under the more blanket, you're warmer and less blanket, you're cooler. Okay, so all that's going on. Way up high in the atmosphere, there's, you're losing heat to the space, whereas down low, it's being trapped by carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. So, uh, usually it's cooler up aloft than it is down below. So this warm, moist air goes up, moves up into the clouds. At some point, it gets cool enough that those water droplets, that water that's, you know, gaseous water, you don't see it, it's completely invisible, it begins to condense out into little bitty water droplets. That's what makes a cloud, okay? Now, so it's carried up. Now the winds also
also carry it sideways. Okay? So these warm, moist air coming off the ocean will sometimes run into a barrier. Okay? That could be a mountain range. Now, I grew up in the southeast, and everything's pretty, it kind of makes sense here. I mean, we got the Gulf of Mexico pumping the moisture up here, it cools and it falls as rain. That, that kind of makes sense. When I was in the Navy, I was stationed for three years, when I was in, in port, we were on the west coast, California, near San Francisco. Uh, the uh, San Francisco Bay is here. Uh, our home port was Concord, California, which was inland a ways <laughs> up a river, the Sacramento River, I believe it was. Uh, and in order to get to our base up inland a ways, you had to go through, literally through, a small mountain range. This was part of the Sierra Nevadas, I guess it was. And literally, you went through it, okay? <laughs> Uh, because as I would drive from San Francisco and Oakland to Concord, you went through a tunnel. The tunnel was through the mountains. And the bizarrest thing, I, I always found this so strange, in the wintertime, uh, the grass was green on the San Francisco side and not much of any color at all on the inland side. In the summertime, it was greener on the San Francisco side and browner <laughs> on the inland side it, because it was so dry. Why? Because that mountain range, all the moisture coming off the Pacific, and look at this, look how much water you travel over, the winds travel over, picking up moisture as they go. They hit the west coast, and then up here are the Cascade Mountains, down here are the Sierra Nevadas, over here are the Rocky Mountains, very little of this moisture makes its way in there. Okay? For instance, one of the wettest cities in the U.S., what city do you think of when you think it's raining all the time? Seattle. Seattle, Washington. You're absolutely right. And just inside Seattle, Washington, you go east into Washington, and it's dry as long. Spokane is not quite a desert, but it's a very dry thing. That mountain range, the Cascades, catch all the moisture coming off the ocean, and it rains on the west side, and it's dry on the east side. The same thing was happening when I drove through the mountain uh, going to Concord, California. It would be wet on the, the, uh, the western side, dry on the eastern side. Okay? That's a barrier. The barrier of mountains are cooler up top, catching the moisture, the moisture comes out. Now, one of my favorite places on the west coast, I've found that someone, a friend, took me there, and then after that I went, any chance I got, which wasn't very often, but any chance I got, a place called Muir Woods, right up against the water, but the mountains went straight up almost. There was a little pocket there, it couldn't have been more than a few <coughs> square miles, it probably was, but it just didn't seem like it, and the giant sequoias were growing there. Those trees went up forever, it looked like. In fact, you had to drive over a mountain range to come in, and it would dry as a bone on the outside, and when you came in, you were way high, and you could see the trees right across here, but they went down forever, you know, and, uh, and there would be clouds in the trees. They were that tall, you know, and then you go down, and it was just moist at the bottom. So all that ocean air came in, full of moisture, and hit the mountains and it all rained. So those trees were huge. Inland from there, you couldn't support a tree like that anywhere. Not enough moisture. It was just a fascinating place to be. Okay? It's a beautiful place. Okay? That's a barrier. Now, other things that happen is you have one air mass hitting another air mass. And when it says different densities, think two things. Temperature is one. That's the big one. The lower the temperature, the slower the air molecules move, they get closer together, they're denser. 
That's why cool air sinks. Warm air rises because the more it heats up, they get more energetic, they bounce further apart, they get less dense, and they rise. Okay, that's why convection happens. So, if you have one air mass, now the, I said think of two things. Density is one, the second one is moisture content. That can make air heavy. Okay, different density. So, let's say that we had, and this is probably what happened today, I don't know for sure, but it's a good guess. We had a bunch of warm, moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? Hit, it hit a little bit cooler air that may be coming down from the Great Plains. That from the Great Plains was uh, cooler with a higher density. The warm, moist air coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, warmer with a higher density, went up over the top, dropped to the dew point, and that's why the rain fell. Now that's a real simplistic thing, but that's generally what's happening. It's cooled by upward movement, whether it hits a barrier or it hits a air mass with a different density and different temperature. Okay, now, how do these clouds form anyway? The cloud formation depends on the atmospheric stability. Now this is a term that I think the book does a pretty poor job of describing. It, does, it describes it correctly, but it just isn't all that clear. When Jerry Tracy talks about it, he can make it much, much clearer than I found that the book does. So stand by with it. Here's atmospheric stability. A stable atmosphere means that this parcel of air that has been cooled, uh, that has been lifted, is cooler and denser than the surrounding air. Now that part of what they're describing makes no sense to me. I know what they're trying to say, but the way they say it really makes no sense. It's saying for a stable atmosphere, the lifted parcel of air is cooler and denser than the surrounding air. I say, well, if it was cooler and denser, it would stay low. It wouldn't be lifted. So, but that's not what they mean. Okay? So what happens, the lifted parcel returns to its original level. Okay? It tends to go back down. So this is the part that one doesn't make a lot of sense. This one does. Okay? That's a stable atmosphere. On an unstable atmosphere, the lifted parcel of air is warmer and less dense than the surrounding air. Well, that makes sense. That's why it's being lifted. And it keeps moving higher and continues to rise until it cools enough and then wants to fall again. That creates an unstable atmosphere. Now, here's how Jerry Tracy, I've heard him describe it before. And I don't know, y'all may be too young to remember. Arnold Schwarzenegger, anyone know who he is? Who? What did what? Yes, you're absolutely right. He, in fact, before that, he was Mr. Universe. He was a weightlifter, bodybuilder, and he won Mr. Universe title. He was strong, big, muscular, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, later, he was also governor of California. <laughs> okay. And then, more recently, he was in the news for this one, he became the boss on The Apprentice before it was shut down, you know, after that other guy was there. Okay. <laughs> Did I say that? Okay. Uh, which, by the way, folks, are any of you, uh, all of you are state of Alabama, I hope all of you are registered to vote, right? You do know there's a runoff election coming up next Tuesday. Now, there's not too many things that are in the runoffs, but there are a few. And if you're in the district, if you're in Jefferson County, the sheriff is a runoff. So don't fail to vote. Please get out there and vote. I'm not going to say who to vote for, but please vote. Don't ever let an election day pass by that you don't vote. Every time. Okay. So anyway, these unstable atmosphere. Oh, oh, back to Jerry Tracy's story. So he said, if if Arnold Schwarzenegger were to come in here and lift me over his head 
that would be a pretty stable situation. I would like it, but he, he can do it. He's that strong. He said, but if I got under there and tried to lift Arnold Schwarzenegger, that would not be stable at all. We'd both be crashing to the floor. And that's sort of what he's talking about here. If the lifted parcel of air, and this sort of doesn't make sense, is moving upward where it's cooler, okay, then that's a stable situation. If it's being lifted upward, it's warmer and being lifted up and less dense, then it's going to keep moving up, and then you're going to get circulation, and we'll see that a little bit later, okay? But I find these figures, and this doesn't do a great job either, but here's the temperature of the surrounding air. Notice it is getting less as you go increasing altitude, but not by much. Here is a parcel of air. Its temperature is less than the surrounding air, so as it's being lifted up, it's on the stable side, it's going to tend to fall back down. Everything's hunky dory here, okay, copacetic. Everything is fine, it's going to go normal. However, if on the other hand, <clears throat> the surrounding air is here, the higher you go, the cooler it gets, but the parcel of air is here, and it's warmer than the surrounding air then it's going to tend to keep rising until it cools and then you're going to have a situation where uh, you have some instability. When we had the rainstorm out there, there was enough instability to cause that to happen. Once the stabilization point was reached again, it quit raining, okay? Now, that rising up of that warm, uh, parcel of air, that's sometimes called a foam. Have you ever watched hang gliders fly? Okay. They do it more out west than they do here, but uh, when we were in the Tetons many years ago, they, people, not me, literally run off the mountainside with these big paragliders and stuff, and then fly along, and they rode those foams. Sometimes that would be, say, over a river, okay, where the water was heating up and stuff, and it would be lifting, or, or the roads were things. Parasailing. Second? Parasailing over a river. Yeah, parasailing does the same type thing. I've done that, that. You have done it? Yeah, and we were in thermals, and we were up there for like 40 minutes extra because we just kept hitting thermals, and we couldn't come down. And you couldn't come down. Uh, and getting, uh, we were just staying up so, there. I yeah. got sick that we were up there for so long. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. Did you go back? Yeah. All right, good man. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure I would. <laughs> but yeah, those are the thumbs. That's exactly what it talked about. You're being lifted up, and if you can catch those, yeah, you can stay up a long time. Watch an eagle fly, or buzzard, or an eagle sound like this. They, just, they hardly ever flap their wings. They just hold them out there in the thermal system of life. Hawks, same type thing. Little birds, they don't have the wingspan to do it. But the bigger birds, well, something they're just elegant. And seagulls are not all that elegant, but they'll glide like crazy. Pigeons are not elegant at all. <laughs> okay, never mind. Okay, so the upward mobility and, and the moist air, the rising moist air cools, eventually reaches the dew point. When it reaches that dew point, now these little droplets condense around, now here's a, a term that you don't see that frequently, what they call condensation nuclei in that saturated air. Okay, now what in the world is the condensation nuclei? They can be different things. Uh, let me just see if I can find what they mention in the book so I don't... Uh, okay. It the, requires the help, the, the condensation, of these tiny microscopic particles, meaning incredibly small, called condensation nuclei. Okay, they don't really give a good de description either. Let me give. Okay? These can be dust particles. Okay? That's all it takes is a little dust particle. Okay? Or salt crystals especially if you're near the oceans, and salt, the, the, the water from the uh, ocean has evaporated, there may be 
did not completely evaporate it, carried a little bit of salt with it, and then they dry it out and you have little salt crystals floating around up there. Anything such as that can be a condensation nuclei. Tiny little thing. When you get these little, little, little bitty things like this, those are called colloids, meaning too small really to be seen with the human eye, but they're very tiny. Uh, the course is tiny. But when they're that small, they tend to be charged, positively or negatively. It doesn't really matter, and that attracts the water molecules because water molecules are polar. We talked about this before, didn't we? Every water molecule has two hydrogens and one oxygen. The hydrogen tends to be positive, the oxygen negative. So they're always polar. Well, if these little charged dust particles up there or salt crystals or other things like that, so tiny that they are colloids and are slightly charged, they're going to attract water molecules. Either the negative will attract the, the hydrogen side, the positive will attract the, the uh, oxygen side. But they attract the water molecules and then they get more <coughs> water molecules. And after a while, after a while, you get these little droplets condensing around those condensation nuclei. Okay? Now, if there are no condensation nuclei, then you get what you call supersaturated air. It has more water in it than it really should hold, but there's nowhere for the water to attach itself so it doesn't come out of you know, the air as quickly. And when it does, a supersaturated, like it gets a blast of uh, dust particles in it, then immediately it'll start, and then you can have some pretty major uh, downpour from that. Now, let me mention one other condensation nuclei, and that could be a little ice crystal, which itself is water, which itself is a polar molecule, but if that little ice crystal attracts this water that's in vapor form, now it starts forming, that either is going to, in fact, most of the time, going to freeze that water molecule, okay, and then freeze another, and another, especially if it's far up there really high, really cold, then these, they start freezing. What you have then form is a hailstorm. And when the hailstorm gets big enough that it, it can't be supported anymore, it falls to the ground. Now, most hail does not make its way to the surface. It melts on the <coughs> way down. But the biggest ones, they do make the cohesion, and when they fall, boy, can they cause some damage. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so the condensation nuclei could be dust particles, they could be uh, salt crystals, or it could be ice crystals. Now, salt crystals attract water too, because guess what? Salt dissolves in water. So it's hungry for water and it's going to attract those. So any one of those will make a condensation nuclei. All right, I wanted to say the ones the book talks about, but it really gets. So, as this air is rising, okay, it is also cooling, okay? But that cooling of the rising air is slow because, now this is a weird concept, but it, it makes sense if you think about it. Let's think about that water on the pot, on the eye, and you're heating it up. Okay, now that water that you're heating up, I say heating up, when you first turn on the pot, that's what it's doing. It's heating the water in the pot, increasing its temperature, until it reaches the boiling point. Now, at the boiling point, the temperature doesn't change. It stays at the boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, stays right there until every bit of water boils away. Then, you add more heat and the steam becomes hotter and hotter and hotter. But at the boiling point, everything's at 100 degrees Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit. Where is the heat going? It's going to change the liquid to a gas. It's not increasing temperature, it's changing phase. Now the same thing happens on the low end too. Okay? <laughs> Have you ever had slightly damp hands and you've got ice out of the freezer? and the ice rose to your hand. You couldn't get it off without hurting, you know, big time. You almost pulled the skin off. 
Or did any of you see that movie? I think it was called The Christmas Story. It was not a, I, one of my favorite movies. I don't know people really liked it. And where the kid, they talked to him, sticking his tongue on the flagpole when it was very, very cold outside and he got stuck there. What's happened then is you're removing heat until you freeze the water, okay? And then you reduce more heat and until all the ice water freezes or going the other way, all the ice melts, you're right at zero degree Celsius. 32 Fahrenheit. Uh, none of you have ice water in here. Uh, quite often, someone will. But um, that ice water, I guarantee it, you put a thermometer in there, zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. They're awfully close to it. Okay? Because any exchange of heat, then, you don't see it in temperature. You see it in hidden heat, changing phase. And that hidden heat is what we call the latent heat. Vaporization. So when you're boiling the water, you're adding more heat, but it doesn't change the temperature, it's changing the phase. Now, when you're condensing it, that's giving off heat. Because the same heat it gathered when it was changing from liquid to, to solid, it's giving off that heat when it changes from a, so, uh, a gas, I said it wrong, a gas to a liquid. It's, it's absorbing heat when it changes from a liquid to a gas gives off heat when it changes from a gas to a liquid. The latent heat of vaporization. Actually, more correctly, the latent heat of uh, condensation, though we call it vaporization for the more easy <coughs> Alright, now, when you get large numbers of those droplets, that's what you see as a cloud. There may be microscopic droplets up there you'll never see. And you might call that a hazy day, but you know, not a cloudy day. But when you get lots of them gathered around, that's what you see as a cloud. Now, why are some clouds dark and some clouds white? It's really all the same cloud. If you're on the underneath of a really dense cloud, the sunlight's not coming through. The cloud looks dark from down here. But if you're looking from the side and the sun's reflecting off that, the water droplets, it looks white. But if you were underneath there, it would be looking dark. It's the same cloud, same kind of thing, if it's a dense enough cloud. So a huge number of droplets appear as clouds. And those clouds are then what transport the water from, say, the oceans to land or wherever. Is that making sense? All right. So what do we mean by precipitate? Okay, evaporate is when it changes from a liquid to a gas. And precipitate, actually, let me give you the actual root of the. Has anyone ever heard of a term called a precipice? Have you ever heard of that term? That's something you could fall off. Okay, if you got to the edge of a cliff and stepped too far, you're down. You're way down. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what precipitation means is to fall or to come out of. Okay. In chemistry, I can remember the first chemistry lab uh, that we did when I was a freshman in <coughs> college, first quarter freshman. Uh, we had a clear liquid that was silver nitrate, it had silver nitrate in it, perfectly clear, you could see through it everything. And we also had a liquid that had sodium chloride, dissolved salt in it. You could see right through that. You didn't see any particles of anything. Until you drop the silver nitrate into the solution of sodium chloride, and then all of a sudden you had stuff falling out. That was called a chemical precipitate because the sodium nitrate, no, the silver nitrate stayed in solution, silver chloride came out of the solution. It fell out. That was called a chemical precipitate. It fell out. Well, that's what precipitation is it's the water falling out of the sky precipitation. Water returning to the Earth's surface, once it reaches that viewpoint, it can't stay in the air anymore as gaseous water. It now forms the water droplets. If those droplets big enough and heavy enough, they're going to fall. That's precipitation. Now, dew and frost are not precipitation. 
Sure, they're liquid, they're water or ice, okay, but they're not precipitation. They're just surface processes. And that's what happened to these windows in the morning. Because outside, and inside too, everything had come to equilibrium overnight. But sometime in the morning, probably an hour or two before we get here, the air conditioning system comes on. They don't run it overnight, I don't think. AC comes on, and now the room gets much cooler than it is outside. Okay? Now that moisture that was in the air uh, outside against the windows <coughs> that have now gotten very cool because those are not well insulated windows, they're not real things, they, the water droplets come out of the solution there. Okay? That's dew. And if it's cold enough, that could be frost. That's a surface process. Nothing's falling out of the sky that's just coming out of the air. Surface process. Um, not precipitation. Rain, snow, hail, that's falling stuff. That stuff that does come out of the sky. Frost and dew are not. Now, precipitation forms in two ways. All right. Now, here comes the ice crystals I was talking about before. And the first of these is the coalescence of cloud droplets. Remember the little droplets around these condensation nuclei are formed way up there in the, in the air. The water has evaporated, gone up as a gas, cooled, cooled, cooled until it can't stay in the air anymore. It'll find these little condensation nuclei, start condensing around those, and form clouds. And usually those are light enough, they stay up there. But if too many of them get coalesced together and bump into each other and connect, now they get so heavy they can't stay up there anymore and they fall. <coughs> now, in some of the very dry summers we've had, I can remember looking at the weather on TV, Jerry Tracy or whoever, talking about it and saying, yeah, you see the green here, that means that you had water coming down, but when it got near the surface where this, the air was hotter and drier, it evaporated again. On the radar, it looked like rain, but it never was reaching the, the, the surface. And you'll hear them saying that this rain is not probably reaching the surface of the ground. That would be so disappointing because you were looking at that saying, please rain today, please rain tomorrow. And you see it, it looks like it's green on there, but it's, it's evaporating again. So the coalescence of cloud droplets, not all of those come down as rain. That some of them actually evaporate when you hit the warmer area and they go back up again. Okay, now if you're way, way up there, it's cold enough that the ice crystals start. And that's why I said the little tiny ice crystals would be your condensation nuclei, and they start growing more ice crystals around them. Okay? More ice crystals, more ice crystals, and that becomes a hailstorm. And that will start falling. But most of the time, especially in this time of year, long before it reaches the surface of the ground, it's going to be warm enough it melts again. And that's why some of those first drops in a, in a storm that's coming in the summertime. Have you seen this sometimes? Those first drops seem like they're big enough to, to hurt you. <laughs> they're big old drops. I can remember driving in a car and just suddenly those big old splats hit the wind. It almost scared you because they were a hailstorm way up there and it melted on its way down and it, it was now a big old drop of water. Okay? So the growth of ice crystals. Now, let's look at the coalescence process. This plate takes place in warm, cumulus clouds near the tropic oceans. Now, we are kind of near the tropic oceans, like the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so some of this is happening there. That co coalescence process is the air is filled with moisture, it goes up, but it cools off and off and starts condensing. That's coming down, and then those droplets combined with other droplets, coalesce, get heavy enough and they fall. Yeah, some of our rain is like that. Much of it could be. The clouds contain giant salt condensation nuclei. That's what I said. Over the Gulf of Mexico, over the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, actually can contain some salt. They say giant salt condensation nuclei. They're not giant. They're tiny. 
but bigger than normal, okay? Uh, ice crystals just up there in the air. Now, the ice crystal process, that takes place in clouds at little latitudes, okay? I love looking in clouds. I mean, I always have, I didn't know what I was looking at in the early years. Now I have a little more idea of what it is I'm seeing. But still, I find them just fascinating to look at. But you know those clouds? Tropics that it never was ice usually. Okay. Now that leads to 23.2. This is the weather producers. Alright, and here again, let me get my globe. Okay. Now this is an idealized model. It doesn't fit completely, but it models it pretty well. Now from 10 degrees north of the equator to 10 degrees south of the equator. There's a pretty narrow band here, okay? Uh, the, it receives more direct solar radiation than any other part. In fact, it's 
between minus 25 and plus, I mean, 23.5 and plus 23.5, but especially that band within 10 degrees of the equator. You see more direct solar energy, and as it does, the air heats up. It rises. Now, where does it go? Okay. Right above the equator, when the air rises, where can it go? It spreads out. Okay. It either goes south or it goes north. After it can only rise so far, and then it moves in north or south. Okay, so the air heats up, rises, and now spreads more toward the poles. As it's spreading that way, it cools and becomes more dense as it rises. Again, I don't like the words here, more dense, and it starts falling, sinking back to the surface at latitudes of 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. 10 degrees north and south here, coming up. Coming back down around 30. There's 30 right there. Okay? 30 north, 30 south. Okay? Where do we live? 33 degrees, 23 minutes, 45 seconds north. We're just in that band. Around 30 degrees north. Okay? And 30 degrees south. Sinking back to the surface. So guess what that produces? That produces low pressure near the equator because the air is rising and then higher pressure where it falls back down around 30 degrees north and south. And we are just in the northern edge of that 30 degree north range. The end result is a band of low pressure near the equator and bands of higher pressure at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Now, the large convective cells form to equalize the pressure. In other words, down around the equator, low pressure and rising air, especially in the summertime when it's really, really hot on the equator, really, really hot, they're going up and now have to do something to equilibrate that pressure. Now, what do we call those? The cells, convective cells that form in the summertime near the equator. Start as tropical, meaning near the equator, depressions, and move into the tropical storm, and move into hurricanes. That's why they form basically June to what, around September in the tropics. We've already had what, one or two named storms, and we're going to have a, a bit more. As the year goes on, as the summer goes on, there'll be more and more of these storms. And just about all of them start somewhere around the equator here off the coast of Africa. And they make their way here and come up and they either go into the Gulf, they go out to the eastern seaboard, or they smack into them. Okay, one or the other. Now, some of these tropical depressions will actually start down here in the Caribbean and stuff, but don't come all the way from Africa. But most of them don't come from Africa near the equator, make their way across. Now, some will go down here. Most of them go up Okay? That's our hurricanes, and that's our hurricane season. Those are the large convective cells that equalize the pressure. Now, how about up here at the 30 degree latitude and above? That's high pressure there. They have to equilibrate. That can sometimes be a tornadic activity. Okay? Because that is the rotation, the uh, Convective cells rotating. And here is Halo. All right. Now we're doing it about what, 120? Okay. Don't want to go too long. Got to call a little bit. What, 230, I think it is. Okay, yeah. No. Two o'clock is when I'm supposed to call a little again. Isn't it? Yeah, 12 to 150. Okay. So at 2 o'clock, I need to call roll again. At 3 o'clock, before 3 o'clock, we stop to have the test. All right, so that's what's happened. You wind up with low pressure near the equator, bands of higher pressure near 30 degrees. Now, there's a lab that we do in physics and physical science. We go down to the lab, and one of the first things I ask you is to pull out the phone, find out what the barometric pressure is in the vessel at that time. 
Well, I have been shocked because you see, I was always under the impression that because we're here in Bessemer, okay, we're a good deal above sea level. So I figured our barometric pressure should be a little bit less than normal for the average atmospheric pressure. That is sea level, you expect to be at 32 inches or whatever it is. And I was expecting us to be a little bit less than that. Every time we've done it, we've either been right at or a little bit above the normal atmospheric pressure. Even though we're well above sea level. And the reason is this. We're in that high pressure area where the air comes back down, settles back into the water. Okay? Now, let's look at the air masses. These are what we call our weather producers. All right? Now, the definition of these air masses or the description of them, they're large, fairly horizontally uniform bodies of air cover large areas, okay? Now, the moisture and temperature within these air masses is basically fairly close to the same. Near the edges, you'll get a little variation, but most of the time, the moisture and temperature is pretty uniform throughout each of these air masses. There are four main types of these air masses. The first of these is called the continental polar. Okay, now what do we mean by that? That means they come from land masses near the poles. So our continental polars would be mostly from Canada and northern US. These air masses make their way south. Okay? They're usually cold and they're usually fairly dry. So the continental polar air mass over in Europe, the Scandinavian countries, they have their own. And then most of the rest get theirs from Russia, okay? Siberia, those areas, the continental polar um, air masses. They're cold and they're typically fairly dry. Now we have friends who live in Fiesta, Italy. Now you know Italy is like this little loop that's in the Mediterranean. And if you went up the west side of that boot, it went all the way to the top where that boot sort of curves around and forms a little curly Q there. And you're actually heading, you're still in Italy, but you're heading over toward Slovenia. And right before you reach Slovenia is Trieste. I mean, it almost is on the border with Slovenia. Now there, and they're right off the Adriatic Sea, big shipping port uh, of the history many, many centuries it's been a big shipping port uh, but they have this big uh, compass roads there and they point to the northeast here and they call that the Bora the Bora means cold cold and what the Bora is is every now and then they get these sweeping air masses coming out of Russia, coming across Eastern Europe, and make their way as far south as the Mediterranean. And they say when those Bora come in, they can literally sometimes blow cars off the road into the bay. So when they know they're coming, they say stay off the road. Get to a place, settle in, because those winds are fierce. Okay? That's continental pole. Okay? For us, it's coming out of Canada. That's the continental pole. Next, we have the maritime pole. Now, that can come on the west coast from, say, the Alaska currents, or on the east coast from the Nova Scotia near uh, Greenland and, and those type of areas. That is the maritime pole, meaning it's coming over water, but it's still cold. Okay? Now, those are usually cold. But usually fairly moist. Okay? I've got to see you talking. We also have continental tropical. Tropical meaning coming from warmer areas, continental coming over land. For us, that's Mexico, the continental tropical. Okay? Continental meaning it's usually going to be dry, tropical meaning hot. And guess what we have down here? 
deserts, the Mojave Desert, the uh, a lot of Arizona and New Mexico is the southern part desert, West Texas desert. Okay, because you got this continental, very hot, dry air coming off of Mexico, and then you have the maritime maritime tropical, and this would be coming off the South uh, Pacific off the Gulf of Mexico big time, that's what we get lots of, and then some coming off the uh, South Atlantic as well. That would be your maritime tropical, okay? That's warm and it's moist, okay? Now, those are your four major air masses. These dictate what we call the air mass weather, the big systems, okay? The weather conditions remain the same over several days. Now, frankly, this summer, until recently, it seemed like we were under the same condition every day, and now it looks like we're going back to that. We had a few days this week that we really didn't have much rain at all, but boy, the month of June, it seemed like it was raining almost every day, wasn't it? And it seemed like we were under some sort of a big air mass weather condition. I don't know that we were, but my guess is that we were. And my guess what that was, we were getting warm, moist air, the maritime tropical, tucked out of the Gulf of Mexico, just constantly. Okay. And then it would get up here, precipitate, get up here, precipitate. Now, more than likely, it was hitting some colder, uh, continental polar air. And that's what made it precipitate. Okay? But when we talk to Jerry, he may go there, but I think we'll get there. Okay? Now, the weather changes when the new air mass moves in or when the air mass acquires local conditions. Like that warm, moist air has been pumped up out of the Gulf. Maybe the rate at which it's coming up has slowed a little bit, and now you're getting it to mix with the normal air and it kind of slows down, and that's what it seems like we have now. It's mixing with the local air, and that's why we're not having big storms, but just rain every afternoon, <laughs> it seems like, or close to it, okay? The air mass acquires the local conditions. A little bit cooler, uh, and the precipitation falls, okay? Any questions on air masses? Okay. Your book has a slightly, I think, better picture than the one here in this one. That's your figure 23.6. Uh, it shows a little more bigger range than, than the one here. Okay. Now, that leads to the concept of weather fronts. Okay. Now, you hear on the on the weather, if you listen to weather at night, I used to pretty frequently. I hardly ever hear it anymore. You just don't turn on the TV that much. Uh, but you'll hear them talk about a cold front, a warm front, a stationary front, some sort of front. They always talk about fronts coming in or leaving or whatever. Well, here's what the weather front is. It's the boundary between the air masses. If we have a continental polar coming in from the north, and it's bumping into a maritime tropical coming up from the Gulf, we're going to have some major rain situation, storm situation. I mean, it's going to be, could be pretty fierce. That's going to be a weather front. The boundary between the air masses when they collide, when they're at different temperatures and generally different moisture contents, especially the different temperatures. So what do we mean by a cold front? Well, we don't have many out in this kind of year, do we? Uh, we're dominated by the warm fronts, it seems like. But we sometimes do. A cold front is when the cold air is moving down. Usually, for us, that would be the continental polar. Coming in, moving in, displaces the warmer air that's already sitting on top of it, and when that warmer air is forced to go up, right? Cold air moving in, warmer air forced to go up, Guess what situation that is? Unstable. That's when we're going to have some pretty big weather measures. Okay? 
The moist air, rising air is cooled, leading to large cumulus and thunderclouds, and then we're going to have some rain. And sometimes pretty major rain at that. Okay? Now, this picture seems completely out of context, but let me try to explain what's going on here. Okay? I think it's pretty obvious you have a continental polar air mass coming down here because here is your front, right there. It gets a little twiggle here, uh, but that's your front, okay? A continental polar coming in. Uh, in the middle of that is a high pressure area. We call this uh, cold air. It sinks. It's dense. It goes down. So the, the high pressure, you have a, a lot of pressure there. Now you have another smaller one over here, a high pressure area. It's not a front. It's not big enough to make a front there. Okay? Or it doesn't quite seem to be. You have another high pressure area here, and I can't tell exactly where this one came from, but this one seems to be coming off the ocean. Okay? Uh, so that's a maritime, and probably. I want to say a maritime tropical, but it's not real clear whether it's coming from here or there. It seems to be coming from the tropical, and but that's higher pressure uh, because usually over the water it's cooler than it is over land, so that's going to increase that. I'm guessing this one came from uh, continental tropical, okay? High pressure uh, here and here, okay? Now, what are these lines around here? This is what I was talking about before. What you did on your tropical, on your topical map, topologic maps that we did in the last lab, you were looking at isoclines, areas with equal elevation. Guess what you're looking at here? Areas of equal pressure, isobars. These are your isobars. And if you could find the numbers right there is, it looks like a thousand. I can't make out exactly what it is because it's so unclear here. But every now and then you'll see a number on them. That's <laughs> what the barometric pressure is there. Okay. Now, here is the only big weather maker on this one. You see this low area pressure here? Notice how close the lines are to each other. These isobars are really close, meaning you have a big, a big change of pressure in a fairly small area. And a big change of pressure in a very small area means you're going to have some very strong winds. Okay. Now, what we hear going on out there is the colliding of clouds, and that's what's making the thunder. That's also where the rain's coming from. The clouds. Okay. Uh, but this is the weather maker here. This is a low pressure area, and it has two different fronts coming out of it. Maybe a third one over here forming. Okay. Uh, this is a warm front moving up this way because the circulation around a low pressure area is counterclockwise. Okay. So you got warm air moving up here. There's a warm front, but it's pulling in cold maritime air here making a cold front, or maybe at least a stationary front, okay? So this, I'm guessing, is a cold front coming down here, at least on this side. It may be a warm front on this side. I think it is, because this high pressure is pushing this way, this one's pushing that way, okay? So here we have a cold front moving this way, warm front moving this way. Here's a cold front moving here and here. Now that's not producing a lot, because you don't have very much change of pressure around little bit of a cell right here it could be a little oh right there there's a low pressure right there and that's probably forming a little bit of moisture uh whatever day this was uh in northeastern georgia probably have a small chance of rain up there uh but not much over here because our lines are too far apart <laughs> maybe when this front came through this cold front came through we got rain a day or two before that but not anymore now the temperature has gone you're back in a stable situation. You're unstable at that front. More moist air going up, the colder air under cutting. Now, what's
What's the warm front? That's when the warm air mass advances over a cooler air region. In this case, oh, let me get back to this. All right, here's the one. Here is the cold front. The cold air mass is moving in. The temperature here was either normal or a bit warmer than normal. The, the cold air mass is moving in, and that lifts the warmer air, usually more moist air, up over the top, cooling it off. You're going to get rainfall. You're going to get rainfall in front and during that front. Okay? Now, when you look at it from above, this is what it looks like. The cold air mass is coming in, forcing the warm air up over the top. An unstable situation. And notice a big temperature gradient here. Anytime you have a big gradient, you can have storms. Pressure gradient, storms. Okay? Moisture gradient, rainfall. Okay? More than likely. So that's the cold front. Now let's look at the warm front. Notice how steep this is and how abrupt that cold air is. Basically plowing under the warm air, forcing the warm air up. Now, we've lost the warm front. Okay, where is our warm front? It's not showing it. Well, I guess it didn't show it in the book either. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, I don't know what's missing from there. Here is that cold air mass coming in. The warm air is over here, okay? And it forces the warm air up fairly abruptly, and this creates these huge, tall cumulus clouds, okay? Now what's going on here, warm air is going up, cold air is coming in, you have temperature change, you have pressure change, and you have Coriolis effect from the Earth's turning, and what this creates is a low pressure area where it spins counterclockwise, and you can have some pretty major storms happening in here. Rainfall ahead of the front and behind the front, all around the front. That is your severe thunderstorm. It could actually be tornadic. It could have hailing. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. When another picture that looks a lot like that. Now let's look at the warm front. Here's the warm front coming in. Okay? The warm front's coming in, it's pushing the cold air out of the way, so it gently is rising over the cold air. Not as abrupt as it was the cold air pushing the warm air out of the way. The warm air pushes and it just tends to go over the top. Now, right here, just past the warm front, you have rainfall. To me, this is a warm front rain. My guess is you've got warm air coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, and you just have gentle showers here. Yeah, you got some thunder, but it's not, it's not super bad. This isn't violently stormy. I don't think there's any chance of a tornado today or anything like that, because this is a, I'm guessing, a warm front. The warm, moist air is coming in, rising over the cold air, a little bit cooler air, didn't feel too cold out there to me, did it? Okay, but it's summertime, and so therefore the moisture is coming out once it gets over the cold air. Now notice, these are cumulus clouds too. These are going up maybe four kilometers. Look at this one, when the cold front comes in, 15 kilometers, okay? That's a lot bigger. That's where you have your violent weather, okay, coming out of this one. Because you have such a difference in altitude, such a difference in temperature, such a difference in pressure. That's going to be, can create some pretty major damage in storms. So there's your warm front. The warm air advances over the cooler air mass, long, gently sloping front. The clouds and rain they form in advance of the front. You get them before the front actually gets you. Okay. which if that's what we've got today, that could be pretty bad. If this is a warm front coming in and it made it feel like the 90 degree air was cool, we could have some hot, sticky stuff coming up after this rain. Now, if it lasts long enough, it might not. But uh, I can remember those summer football practices. We get the rain and we say, ha, 
boy, we may not have practice. They not the rain would be over with in no time. We get out there and it was so humid you wanted to puke. I mean, it was just miserable. You know, it was worse it seemed like after rain than it was before rain, and that's why. Okay, and then we have the stationary front. Here, the forces influence the warm and the cold air masses become balanced, and they really don't do anything. The cold air doesn't push the warm out of the way. The warm doesn't push over the top of the cold. They just become balanced. Now, I can remember, it was a year or two ago, I can't remember exactly where it happened. It seemed like it was... Was it Tennessee or somewhere there that they started having rain and just had rain day after day after day after day? And they just were, they were saturated because it was a stationary front. Neither front was winning the battle, but they just kept precipitating on that same little narrow band. Dry up here, it's not so wet down here, but it, I can't remember where that was. In fact, I heard of it somewhere this year too where they had, oh, it was just a couple weeks ago. Now, this was a much minor, more minor one. Tuscaloosa had five inches of rain, and we had three-tenths, okay? That was a lot of rain. It was the rain on that day. It was the most rain they had ever had ever on record, but it was like the fifth or the twelfth rainiest day ever that they had had. I believe it was Tuscaloosa. And what would probably happen we were just behind the front, or before the front one. They were sitting right on them, and it's, it stalled. and became a stationary front and just dumped and dumped and dumped and dumped water for hour after hour. Okay? That can happen. Stationary <coughs> front. The forces that influence the warm and cold air masses become balanced, and it doesn't move. All right. Now. There is a nice little blurb at the top of page 581. This is called Urban Heat Islands. It's a strange term, but it really is pretty effective. Now, I notice this more in the wintertime, okay, or late fall, early spring. I will leave here sometimes because, say, this fall, uh, second mini term. I will leave here. I have a second mini term physical science 112 class, or I have I've had for several years. It probably will be this time too. That starts at 3:15 in the afternoon. Goes. It's a mini term, so it's going to be 3:15 to 6:45, and then the lab will be 6:45 to 8:45, or something like that. Okay, it's a long class late into the day, okay? And I'll leave here sometime 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Get in my vehicle, and it's already pretty chilly by then, okay? Late November, early December. So let's say it's 50 degrees when I get in my vehicle, okay? Now, which way am I going? I'm going a little bit north, okay? Which should make it, if anything, a little cooler. I'm going east, it's a little bit east. Well, uh, it's, the sun's been down longer there than it has here, so it should be a little bit cooler. Uh, and it's later at night. You know, I'm driving for 30, 45 minutes, so it's getting later. It should be getting cooler as I drive. I got the thermometer in the car there. And sure enough, when I leave Bessemer, uh, I'll see the temperature usually drop a degree or two until I get near Fairfield and Minkley and stuff. It's somewhere there. As I get closer to Birmingham, suddenly the temperature starts going up again. And it'll keep going up, and sometimes it'll be five degrees cooler when I get to Birmingham than it was when I left Bessemer. It's later at night, it's further north, and it's further east. Why would it be warmer? Because it's an urban heat island. Okay? And they talk about it here, and these have actually been documented. Just by always, whatever they say the temperature is outside, our thermometer is always two to, two to five degrees warmer because we're in the city. 
at the airport. It's open space. It's, it's going to be a little bit cooler there. And we're not but a few miles from the airports, okay? Uh, so anyway, it's a good little blurb. I highly recommend you read it. It's very short. There are some questions, and if that's something you want to do as a paper topic, hint, hint, uh, you could do that. Okay. Now, the next topic here, this is waves and cyclones. This is still under your weather makers. Your fronts come from your continental air masses, or your, your air masses, continental or tropical or, or polar or maritime, whatever, okay. What the waves and the cyclones come from basically is from your really big weather makers. Now let me see if I can describe it, okay? The mechanism, and this is a little tough definition of that word, are bulges or waves that often form between the oppositely moving air masses. So these are the things that happen right on your fronts. Oppositely moving air masses, bulges or waves, often form between these oppositely moving air masses. Okay, let's see if I can get a figure to show it. So here we have warm air, and this again to me is a ridiculous slide. I'll you. They have the warm air on the bottom and the cold air at top. That is definitely an unstable situation, folks. A very unstable situation. Because the warm air wants to rise and the cold air wants to, to, uh, to come down. Okay? So that forms this bulge or wave. The warm air is wanting to rise, the cold air is wanting to come down. It creates this wave front, a warm front. Well, it's a warm front going this way, the cold front is just going that way. Okay? Now, so you see they have the cold front on this side, the warm front on this side. Now, they're not sure who's winning yet. It just creates this front, this bulge, this wave. The overriding uplifted cold air produces low pressure area. To me, that's sort of ridiculous. It's the warm air rising should be producing the low pressure area. But what they're saying here is as the cold air has to go over the top of this warm air coming up, that's what they're meaning. It's just like an airplane wing or a bird wing. Okay? Have I shown you this before? It was Bernoulli's effect. Okay. What happens if I blow on the bottom side of this piece of paper? Predict. The paper will rise and sets. Sure enough, it did. Okay. What if I blow over the top of the paper? What will happen? Anything? The paper comes up. Why? Okay. The why is what we call Bernoulli's effect. Because the air going over the top is going at a faster speed than the air that's on the deep. Okay? And in doing that, there's more distance between the molecules, so the pressure's less, and that pulls it up. Okay? And that's exactly why planes fly. If you've ever noticed the wing of a plane, they're bulbous like this and taper down. Now, they also slant down bulbs like this. Okay. You look at a, a bird wing. Big on the front edge, tapering off on the feathers on the back edge. And what's happening there, the air is forced to go faster over the top than it is over the bottom. And the greater the difference in temperature and, and speeds, the greater what we call the lift. Okay. That's why planes take off. That's why they take off down the runway, cut those engines off full black. <gasps> You know, going faster and faster, and finally when they get fast enough, and the air speed over the top is enough greater than that over the bottom, that provides the lift. That's why planes fly. Okay. Don't ask me why a helicopter fly, I don't know. <laughs> but airplane, that, that makes sense. Okay? So, the air, cold air moving over the top, when it gets over here, it's at lower pressure because it's had to go at a larger distance, decreasing greater speed, decreasing the pressure, the news effect, okay? So, the overriding uplifted 
intensely cold air produces a low pressure area right behind that front. Further cold air front motion leads to an occluded front, and that's what this is, the, the low pressure here, and by the way, since it's low pressure, the cold air comes rushing down behind it. Um, the warm air is trying to push its way up this way. Uh, this air is pushing against here, but is it pushing against this? So guess what you got? Circulation. Yeah. It's what? Oh, is it two o'clock? Okay, you want today's dumbing, last chapter's test. Is that? Yeah. Okay, do you want to go into the office there? Because I'm making a lot of noise out here. Turn on the light, whatever you need. Cassidy, do you want to make up one now? Mm -hmm. Which one? Uh, it's not the last one, but it's the one. I have two systems. Okay, well, which one are you wanting to make up uh, now? I'm taking both of them right now. Okay, well, which one you want to take first? Which one do you want to go? Well, you name it. <laughs> Just get one. Huh? Just get one. No, he had a doctor's appointment. And you took test three. Mm -hmm. I think I had that one. But yeah, you did take test three. I just saw it. So let's see about test four. Test. No, you haven't done test four. The next office you can go to that one if he's in your first one. Okay. No, we're going to start the test before three, so let me know. Don't let three o'clock sneak up on me. It's getting close to two right now, right? So, in just a minute, in fact, as soon as we finish the slide, I'll stop and call the roll. When you tell me to take a little break, you can. Okay. So, the overriding uplifted air produces low pressure. Further cold air motion leads to what we call an occluded front. <clears throat> now, what that produces is the circular motion of air. And this is your low pressure air. It goes in a counterclockwise direction and looking down on it. Okay? The low pressure area with inflowing upward force winds, because it's low pressure, uh, the, the winds go up. The circulation pattern caused by the Coriolis effect. I don't know if you remember that. If, I'm going to do it in the wrong direction now, if you drop something from way above the Earth's surface, because the Earth is turning, as it falls, it creates a circular motion. And again, if something was moving up, it creates a circular motion in the other direction. One of these is clockwise, that's the Coriolis and that's what produces in these low pressure areas the counterclockwise motion of the air. And guess what? Look at every hurricane you'll ever see on the weather map always going counterclockwise. Look at every tornado you'll ever see is going counterclockwise. These low pressure, also these occluded fronts, those produce these serious, serious weather conditions. Tornadoes and, and hurricanes. Okay? And the Coriolis effect. And by the way, there's another potential paper top. Who in the world is Coriolis? How does Coriolis effect deal with weather? I mean, there's, I can think of about three or four different topics you can write on just that word there. Now, the reverse of that is your high pressure areas. And this, you have what they call the anti cyclone. The air is sinking, is warm, and relative humidity is lower. And that's why usually with high pressure we don't get rainfall. We got low we got low pressure out there, we produce the rainfall we got now. High pressure, no rainfall. In fact, um, I remember one summer, one of the last summers I was home, it was one hot, dry summer. And we just every time we looked at the weather, 
Now, under high pressure again today, under high pressure again tomorrow, we knew there was going to be no rain in those days at all. So the pressure is lowered, lowered because the air is coming down from cooler to warmer relative to humidity reduces. And high pressure areas are always clockwise. Now I say always. I said from where you sit, which will probably be the case. But guess what? Uh, this is a dumb story. I probably shouldn't tell it, but I'll tell it anyway. I had a professor at Georgia Tech, a business professor, uh, actually for two or maybe three classes, I know two classes, maybe three. Uh, one from the grad school, one from undergrad. I may have had over two, had over two in undergrad, maybe one in grad school, whatever. But he was. He was the editor of one of the big crystallographic magazines out of Germany or somewhere. He knew this stuff in his life. Okay? And as editor and stuff, they had the International Crystallography Association, whatever it's called, meetings one time down in Rio de Janeiro. Anyone ever heard of Rio? It's the party city of the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil is the big capital, or it's not the capital. But it's the economic capital of Brazil, the biggest city in Brazil. It's all business pretty much. Up the coast a little way, you get to Rio. That's the party city, okay? It's a beautiful city from what I hear. I've never been there. But that's the party city in the whole southern hemisphere, I think. Okay? So Dr. Anyway, he was he was uh, president of this court. Uh, Editor in chief of the magazine, they had the big meetings, but he was on his way the first time ever to the southern hemisphere to Rio de Janeiro, the party city of the southern hemisphere. Okay? And he said he just couldn't wait when he landed and got to go to the club. He went running up to his room, ran to the bathroom, and flushed his toilet. Because in the southern hemisphere, Yeah, party city, and I want to go flush a toilet. Yeah, that's my idea of a good time. Um, dumb story. Okay. But he told the story, uh, so I know it must be true. Uh, he didn't realize what that made him sound like. Okay. Now, the waves and the cyclones. I think if you were to talk with Rick, Jerry Tracy, and he was to talk about especially tropical waves, those are the things that come in out of the Gulf and out of the South Atlantic and come up from the tropics and move east to west. That's not common here in the U.S., but they do do it sometimes. And anytime you have something like that, that's going to be what they call a tropical wave. Now, what they're talking here, the cyclones, because we're prevailing westerly, these are the common tracks for some of the severe tornadic activity. And look at this one here. That track here is the one that was followed in, what was it, May of 2011? Back when the whole string of tornadoes hit up and down Alabama. I mean, category five tornadoes, two or three, four or five on the ground at the same time from southern Alabama to northern Alabama. What's the city up in northern Alabama got hit so hard? It was like a whole city was destroyed. Uh, once it was not Hamilton, but it was uh, uh, some sort of way. And then Tuscaloosa got hit like crazy. Uh, north of Birmingham got hit pretty badly. Coleman got hit. We didn't get it too badly here, but it got tornadic activity around, but all up and down. I mean, it was all day long. They were saying, Look, we're only going to talk about the Category 5s that are within 20 miles of us. We can't, we can't worry about the others, you know, where normally any tornado is going to get full attention of everybody. They were just picking the ones closest and most dangerous. That's the track pretty much they follow. The Midwest, Oklahoma, has very powerful storms, typically through here. Uh, this is another popular track in Kansas. Uh, and you get them all over the place, but these are the 
most of the they call these tornado alleys or not. This is where they go. Okay. And those are the cyclones. Counterclockwise. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's stop there. Major storms, that's where we'll pause. Do y'all need a little break? We're in chapter 23, uh, weather and climate, and we're still in the weather part of the chapter. The climate part is the second half. Maybe not quite half, but we have made it through uh, clouds and precipitation. That was 23.1. Weather producers, that was 23.2. And we're right at the end of that talking about major storms. And the weather producers, we had several big topics. The first of these was your air masses. The second of these was the weather fronts. And the third of those was waves and cyclones, okay, which have to do with the fronts. So you're here at Major Storms? Major Storms on page 582. Which is 184 in ours. Yeah, it may be. I don't know. I don't have that number. Okay. Uh, you're 23 14. Uh, 23.12 is on the same page, and 23.13 and 14 on the next page. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we just did 23. 13, that was under the last slide. Okay, so major storms. <clears throat> These are rapid, violent weather changes, often associated with the frontal passage. Okay, at least two of these are anyway. Three major types of uh, major storms, major types of major storms. Uh, the first of these is thunderstorms. These are definitely related with frontal passages, quite frequently, okay? Now today, even though there was a little bit of thunder, I wouldn't have really counted that a severe thunderstorm, okay? A little bit of a storm, maybe a little bit of a frontal passage there, but it was mostly just a summer rain, okay? So there was some thunder with it, okay? The second of these, the ones that really now, thus far down here are tornadoes, okay? They can do incredible amount of damage, but usually to a fairly small located area, okay? But when they hit, they're intense. Hurricanes, on the other hand, cover enormous areas with lots and lots of energy, but it's spread over a much larger area. So they also create some, some major problems. Now, tornado, I mean, hurricanes can spawn tornadoes and thunderstorms as well, so they can produce all three, okay? So let's start with the sort of mildest, the thunderstorms. They usually develop in a warm, very moist, and unstable air. Remember, we talked about the unstable air. That's when the warm air, warm, moist air is rising fairly quickly and pulling with it and creating a... Um, an unstable situation, okay, in the air. There are three stages here. Now, this is what I've been trying to talk around. Here we're finally going to see the whole picture here. Okay, the first of these, you might say, they call it the cumulus stage, which you kind of associate with accumulating all the conditions to make it happen, okay? It's associated with convection. Remember, convection is the rise of the warm, moist air, okay? Seeking of the air around it, you know, that's the uh, cold air. Associated with the convection of that, it could be the mountain barriers, it could be a cold front. We don't have any mountain barriers here, but cold fronts we do have. This is where our thunderstorms usually occur. The cold front moving in against warm, moist air. Now, I mentioned before, and I probably just want to so let it slide by, the big drivers of these major storms are what you call your gradients, okay? What I mean by that, it can be a temperature gradient, it can be a pressure gradient, okay? And those are usually somewhat related to. What I mean by temperature gradient, you have very cold, air here, very warm air here, the bigger the difference, the more major your clash is going to be. Or when you have very high pressure here, very low pressure here, 
the bigger the class is going to be. It's when those temperature gradients are the greatest and the pressure gradients are the greatest. So it's associated with that, that kind of a cold front. Cold air moving in underneath warmer air, forcing it up, unstable situation. That's when these cumulus clouds are dead. See, the warm, moist air has to, is being forced upward because of the um, front moving in. Okay? Now, that's when it's forming, accumulating. The mature stage, now the updraft that is created by this uplift of the warm, moist air can no longer support the growing ice crystals. Remember, I talked about that. The ice crystals have been growing in this time. Uh, excuse me just a second. Let me make sure I have the key for that for the weekend. Otherwise, I won't be able to get it graded. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so what's happened? Your warm, moist air is rising. As it rises, it cools. Okay, now depending on where this is happening, okay, remember this could be in the mid latitudes, and in those mid latitudes, this air up here is quite cold. You have little ice crystals floating around up there, they become your condensation nuclei, and the water attracts to them and grows and grows and grows bigger and bigger ice crystals. If it's down on the, in the tropical areas like the Gulf of Mexico, this could be salt crystals up in the air and now the water droplets are gathering around those. But whether they're water droplets or ice crystals, now we're going to focus on the ice crystals where this book is written, that's what they get most of the time. We get quite a few too. We don't realize it, but we do. So if they are being uplifted and hitting those ice crystals up here and growing and growing heavier and heavier, some of them can't be supported by the updraft anymore. You know how when you got a, a mass of people moving, you sort of get carried along by the crowd. But when it slows down, then you, you, you tend to stop. Same thing happens in a stream bed. If it's going fast, big old chunks of rock can be carried along. When it slows down, then the rocks fall, fall out precipitate out. Okay? That happens here too. When the updraft is continuing and pushing up, the ice crystals go bigger and bigger as they go up. But at some point they can't support it anymore and they start falling down. Okay? So at that stage your updraft no longer supports the growing ice crystals and the snowflakes. The falling frozen water could melt as it falls and become those big drops of rain. Okay? Now, if this is a monster storm, remember we saw some clouds that went up and saw 15 kilometers. If this was one of those and it kept going up, and they call these the supercell, super storms, you know, keep going up and then start coming down and then get another and go up, there the ice crystals just keep growing. As they go up and down, they just keep forming more and more water until finally they get so heavy they fall out, and they don't have time to melt before they land. That's when you get hail. Hail is formed through the ice, uh, ice accumulation cycles if it just keeps happening. They start to get heavy, and then they get picked up by another draft, and then they get heavy and picked up, and they just keep growing until finally they fall, and they're so heavy, they don't melt, and that's when you get hail. And it, when do we have these hail storms? Late spring, summer? Why is ice falling out of the ground when out of the sky when it's 80 degrees outside, 70 degrees outside? That shouldn't be happening. That's why it's happening. 
forming these super mature supercells. Okay? Now, finally, finally, all of the updrafts are exhausted. Okay? It's been raining for a while, things were cooled off, the air is no longer, it's no longer as unstable, so now it just rains. And that's what we were having earlier. I don't think it ever got to very much of a super, well, it definitely wasn't a super storm. Uh, there was a little bit of thunder there. That could have happened when, that, you see, some of the air is moving up, some is moving down. That could have created the thunder, you know, the, the, the moving parts. But then at the end, it was just rain. That's what's happening there. And that's the kind of rain I love. That slow, steady, uh, suck in rain. I love that. All the updrafts are exhausted, and just you have your rain, and soon the clouds dissipates. Okay, there's your thunderstorms. Now, why do we call them thunderstorms? You hear thunder. We heard thunder. Did anyone see any lightning? Can you have thunder without lightning? Yes. No. You may not see lightning, but if there's light, if there's thunder, it had to come from somewhere. And that was a lightning strike somewhere. It may be that lightning strike was on the other side of the cloud that you never saw because the cloud was too thick in between. But if you hear thunder, there had to have been lightning. Do you ever have lightning with no thunder? Yes. No, <laughs> because anytime you have lightning, there is going to be that compression wave. You may not hear it. It may be the lightning so far away, you'll just see it and never hear it because the energy is dissipating before it reaches you. Okay? So, lightning and thunder, the updrafts, downdrafts, like I was talking about before, the air masses moving past each other, circulating precipitation, separate electric charges. It's kind of like, if you ever done this, those of you who have hair, I'm <coughs> sorry, um, it's not that funny, okay. When you've been combing your hair with, say, a, a rubber comb or something like that, and then you find that your hair is following the brush, you know, <laughs> Calls it static electricity. What you're doing when you're combing your hair, you're rubbing electrons off your hair onto the comb. And now the comb is negative charge, the hair is positive charge, you pull it away and there it goes. It goes follows the comb because they're opposite charge. Or you take the uh, underwear out of the dryer and they're stuck to everything else in the dryer, okay? Why? Because of static electricity. Well, the same thing happens here. Notice the dryer has been moving things past each other, two different types of fabric. Knocks electrons off of one onto the others. Now they tend to stick. Well, this is happening here. Air mass is moving up, down, around, circular, and stuff. The clouds are bumping into each other. Other things are separate the electrical charges. Some part of the cloud gets positively charged. Some part of the cloud gets negatively charged. Okay? Charges accumulate in different parts of the thunderhead, and when those charges accumulate and get big enough, enough charge separation, then they discharge. In other words, the electrons go from the high intensity area to the low population area. That's a lightning strike. Okay? So lightning is the discharge between the charge centers. Okay? Here is a graphic that kind of shows that. Big old thundercloud here, okay? Circulation and stuff. Your electrons get uh, collected here. The, the ions without electrons get collected here and here. And what happens? Well, the electrons discharge and go to here. The electrons discharge and go to ground. The electrons on the ground discharge and go up to the cloud. Or the electrons from this cloud move over to this cloud, okay? Any one of these, this is called cloud to cloud lightning. This is called cloud to ground lightning. This is called ground to cloud lightning. And you can't have any of those, okay? Any of them, okay? Now, I've actually seen one or two incredible shots that someone took during a thunderstorm and that happened to be taking the picture right as lightning was hit and you see the lightning strike leaving the ground going up to the clouds. It hits about halfway there and that's when the camera it's just unbelievable because it's wherever the negative charges are going to the positive charge. 
always goes in that direction, negative to positive, negative to positive, negative to positive. Okay? So when that happens, the discharge can be, I uh, already said this, cloud to ground, ground to cloud, cloud to cloud. Now, when you have that big of charge separation and charge discharge, I mean, that is a lot of energy going very quickly and heating up the air around it very rapidly. Okay? That creates a huge pressure wave followed by a rare fraction. Guess what that is? Sound. That's how I'm talking to you. I'm forcing air through my vocal cords, through the larynx, and it's creating vibrations. If you hold your hand in front of your mouth and talk, you feel those little vibrations of air. Okay? That's what's happening. That's what sound is. So when you have a lightning discharge, you know, just suddenly that, it, I mean, it heats up really fast. And lightning, if that lightning ever strikes somebody or something, it burns because it's very hot. There's, there's, I mean, a lot of discharge going on. It expands and then shrinks. That's a pressure wave and that produces the crack of thunder. Whether you see the lightning or not, the thunder happens. Whether you hear the thunder or not, the lightning happens. You can't have one without the other. And if you have one, you have both, whether you see or hear it or not. Okay? It may be, and by the way, light travels many times faster than sound does. So sometimes you'll see lightning and a few seconds later hear thunder and you say, well, no, there was no thunder with that. Yes, there was. That's what you heard several seconds later, you know. In fact, the old saying was, count the number of seconds after you see lightning and that's how many miles away. Now, that's just an approximation, but it is a pretty good deal. If you see lightning, even though it's really bright, it's really intense, you say 1,001, 1,000, and then hear a massive crack of thunder, you know that was at least three miles away or four miles away or whatever it was. So you may not have to get into shelter immediately. If you see lightning, boom, you know, and it's just immediate, that's close, folks. And I, actually, that happened to me one time driving back to, uh, to school. Uh, I lived in about three hours away from Atlanta where Georgia Tech was. Sunday afternoon, my mom had fixed just this wonderful meal. I'd eaten way too much because I'd been hungry all week, you know, anyway. Driving back to school, and I swear I wasn't more than five miles from home. I was so sleepy, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it there. It just happened to be a big storm decided to hit that time. And lightning struck a tree or something right by the side of the road there. I mean, the flash was so intense and the noise was something. I got enough adrenaline in my system, I did my, my eyes didn't even want to close the rest of the trip. You know, two and a half hours to, to, to the campus. It was, thanks for that lightning bolt, I needed that, okay. So, that was the closest I've ever seen. All right, moving on to tornadoes. Those were our thunderstorms. By the way, there is a figure in the book at I swear some of their figures. Uh, the figure 2314 they were talking about earlier, uh, and it is sort of true, but it's it's a bizarre kind of the way they have the lines going. It is exactly what's happening, but it's not a very instructive figure to me. But maybe it is to you. Okay? Now this other figure in the book on page uh, 585, it's uh, figure 2317. Look at the size of that hailstorm, stone. Uh, that was uh, damaging automobiles. I can believe it structures. I can believe it crops. I really can believe it. They don't say where it was, but uh, that was one major hailstorm there. Okay. Now, moving on to tornadoes. Believe it or not, these are the smallest of our violent weather things. A thunderstorm is going to cover a big area, tall, I mean, it, it's 
event, okay? Part, a hurricane's massively huge. You cover a whole state or something. Tornadoes, very small. But they're the most violent weather disturbance we have. The winds in a tornado are sometimes 10 times stronger than those in a hurricane. Believe it or not, it's just there's a lot more wind in a hurricane, it covers a lot bigger area. So this is a rapidly whirling column of air what a tornado is. The diameter can be from 100 meters. Anyone got a clue about 100 meters, what that is? 100 meters? See, here in the south, everybody, most people understand, about the length of a football field. It's a little bit longer. It would be like from one end zone, back of one end zone to the goal line of the opposite way. It's a little bit longer than so 400 meters, that's what 400 meters is, folks. That's about a quarter of a mile, okay? Guess what? Those storms that happened in May 11, some of those were way over 400 meters in width because you can see the paths. It's amazing, okay? The wind speeds up to 480 kilometers per hour. Get that in the miles per hour, that's about about 300 miles per hour. 300 miles per hour wind speeds. Amazing. The damage produced, now, I would, well, maybe this is wrong. Damage is produced by high winds. If you've got 300 mile per hour wind, those are high winds, okay? And that can create a lot of damage. But sometimes, the damage is greater in that drop in pressure because the drop in pressure to produce that big of wind is an enormous drop in pressure. Have you ever noticed in hodetic areas that roofs are never caved in? They're always pulled off. Houses are pulled off the foundations, okay, because of that drop in pressure. Um, it looks like to be about 235, something like that. Okay. And this is a combination of the two. The flying debris are called debris is caused by the high caused by the high winds. Okay? And that's big damage producers. So remember the first of the summer when we went over safety? We said get away from windows. Because if it was a tornado out there, some of those limbs are going to be detached from the trees, and if they just happen to be heading in the wrong direction, they'd be coming right through those windows. Okay? You don't want to be there. You don't want to be in the same room with all that glass flying around. Okay? That's why you want to be lowest level interior. Lowest level, so you're not up uh, where things will be knocked around or an interior not near any windows. Now, as I said before, these are sometimes associated, in fact, most of the time, associated with the most intense thunderstorms. So if you have a thunderstorm, that could be producing a tornado. If you have a hurricane, that can be producing thunderstorms and tornadoes. So tornadoes could be produced by any of those. Okay? Here's a picture of one. Now, I think this one, if I'm remembering, was around Dallas, Texas. Let's see what this one is. This one that's in your book was uh, Marquette, Kansas. And it seems like that may have been the same year that ours hit in Alabama. It seems like we were in May and they were in June or July. Uh, but it seems like it was around the same time because no sooner were we out of the news before they were in the news. It, it was it was awfully close. And they can be way devastating. Okay. Now whoa. That's all they say about tornadoes. Okay. Um, I thought there is in your book, and I think it's worth looking at on page 586 
or if you have the other numbers, 2314, the 14th page in chapter 23, if you have that number. Um, some things on tornado damage, and they give the scales here. Tornadoes are rated on wind speed and damage. Here is a scale with approximate wind speeds. They call them category 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That day in it was April or May, I don't remember, I keep saying May, but maybe it was April 2011. No, Say again? It was April. April 23rd, maybe, or something? Huh? 27th? Okay, 27th, y'all. You must have been there. Okay. Yeah, you were? Okay. Uh, didn't hit anything near us, but I mean, it was, it was awful. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in the state, if I remember correctly, I think there were sometimes three or four Category 5 tornadoes hitting various places in the state at the same time. And over the day, there were several. I don't know how many. Now, the very next fall after that April, when we went to the Weather Center at Channel 13, they were still buzzing about that series of tornadoes. And Jerry Tracy said at the time, there's sort of an informal in index that the weathermen use just for themselves. You see, so many conditions have to be just right for tornadoes to occur. There has to be something about the upper atmosphere, wind speeds and pressures, and the lower, and this, and the that. There's several things. What they do, they combine all these things and come up with an index. And if one's, say, a, you know, a three and the others are five, and one's a negative four, you're not going to have, you may have some tornadic activity, but it's probably not going to be bad. I don't know how they rate them. But anyway, whatever it was, and I'm sure those numbers weren't ac accurate. But I think he said that day the index was resting at something around 400. And nobody had ever seen that high of an index, ever, anywhere close to it. They didn't know what to expect. They thought, oh my word. <laughs> you know, we've never seen a number like this. We don't even know what to tell people except it's going to be bad. And it was. Now, category zero storm. Light damage, the winds are under. 75 miles per hour, which is pretty fast, by the way. 75 miles per hour. If a car is doing that, they're going to get a ticket sometimes, okay? Damage to chimneys, tree limbs broken, small trees pushed over, signs damage, that kind of stuff. I was at home at the time. I was here in Birmingham. But on the farm in Georgia, my mother was still alive then. Uh, there was a category zero that went through. Okay? Category zero, lowest classification. Now, it just happened to be my younger brother, oldest daughter, my niece on that side, uh, was engaged to be married. And her fiance's parents. Now, we grew up on a small farm in Georgia, okay? My younger brother was like the vice president of a small rural electric company. Lived out in the country, farmed on the side. I mean, lived pretty simply. I mean, nothing fancy. Betsy had gotten engaged to this guy whose father was the chairman of pediatrics at Ohio State University Medical School. Okay, whoa, honcho, honcho and a half. Well, and they're nice people. In fact, my wife knew him because she's a pediatric here at UAB. So, in fact, he had been at UAB before she had to know him then, which is lovely. Uh, he had done a rotation there or something. So anyway, he's, yeah, so nice people, even though really high up, very nice people. This was their visit to the farm, you know, before the marriage or when you exchange parents, that kind of stuff. So they had come to the farm to meet my brother and his wife, and um, they had said there could be a pretty good chance of rain later in the day, so Dad wanted to take them out and show the farm. So he hauled them out there and drove them around, probably in a truck, you know, or an SUV or something, driving around the farm, out through the fields, 
and he was showing them this one field, uh, and the cows were around, he was showing them the herd, and they heard sort of this whoosh, you know, type of noise. They looked across, and the adjacent farm to ours, it used to be a dairy, you could see a tornado moving across the path there. And he turned around and looked, the cows had disappeared. I mean, it's like they were removed from their leaving up. They had just disappeared. They had sensed it before they heard it. They just didn't notice the cows were out of there. And here they were out in the middle of a field with a tornado in sight. So they went down, got into a ditch that had old cement blocks and other things in it, and they were there. This is a good way to introduce your parents in law, I mean, your daughter's parents in law to the farm. <laughs> they thought, are they going to? Call off the sun and take it out of this place. I don't know. No, didn't do that. Okay. But anyway, that was a category zero storm. It was a big house. My older brother and his wife had just moved out of this house because her mother had recently died and her brother actually owned the house. So as long as the mother was alive, he wanted them to stay there and take care of his mom because she was a nurse. Uh, his daughter was my brother was married, so he was a nurse. And then once the mother died, get out because we want to take over the house. So they had only been out like a couple of weeks. And that grand old, big old house up on the hill was actually moved on its foundation by a category zero storm. Okay, it's just amazing the energy these things have. So it made its way across the field. It must have gone down the road or something, come across, and then headed up, changed direction, cut a swath of trees through my mother's yard, she had woods in front, cut the swath through. Now, it didn't pull them all up, but it damaged them enough they had to take them down later. And took off part of her magnolia tree, hooked around the house. All it did was move a couple of posts and blow off some shingles. That's all the damage it did to the house. Went around the house, completely demolished my dad's shit, uh, work tool, you know, building where it was a concrete block building. There was hardly one block left on top of the other. The roof was gone for good. No one ever found the roof. Big, major roof. I mean, the building was the size of these two classrooms together. You know, a good sized building, concrete block, just about completely left. A few blocks left on one wall, all the rest of them destroyed. Roof taken off into the woods somewhere, okay? Unbelievable damage. And that was a category zero. Okay. Um, category one, moderate damage from 76 to 112 miles per hour wind, roofing materials removed, mobile homes and moving autos pushed around and overturned. So do not get on the road and try to head home or anywhere else during a tornado event. Get out of the car into a ditch. That's what my brother and his future in laws did. Category two, considerable damage, that's 113 to 155 mile an hour winds, roofs torn off houses, mobile homes demolished, box cars, not just cars, box cars overturned, large trees snapped and uprooted, light objects become missiles. Okay, you don't want to be there. Category three, severe damage, 156 to 205 miles per hour winds, Roofs and some walls are torn off of homes. Whole trains are overturned. Most trees are uprooted, not just snapped, but uprooted. Cars are lifted off the ground and thrown around, okay? Now, my wife was from Huntsville, Alabama, and when she was in high school, they had a tornado up there in the spring one year, and she said literally cars were thrown through intersections. They had another one up there I think it was after we were married that was uh, that was pretty bad too. Okay, you don't want to be in a car during a tornado. Category four: devastating damage. Winds from 206 to 260 miles an hour. Homes are completely leveled. Cars are thrown. Large missiles are generated. This is some of those storms that in April of 2011 were. Many of those were category four storms. Category five, incredible damage, winds 
261 to 318 miles per hour. Homes are demolished, swept away, automobile-sized missiles fly through the air more than 100 yards. Trees are debarked, not just uprooted. The bark is taken off by the body. Just amazing. Okay. Now, Okay. I've got to get those keys right. No now, you don't want any Category 5s. I can't think the name of that town up in northwest Alabama. It seemed like it was a two word name. I don't believe it was Fort something, but it was some name, and I swear, I mean, I saw pictures of it. Big manufacturing plant, nothing but concrete. I mean, where it was there. Now, I think it was that storm, those storms, we, um, or it may have been the ones at Oak Grove, because a few years before they had been there. Um, but I think it was those in, in 2011. We didn't have anything. They said there was a tornado, a smaller one, that you, if we hadn't had trees, we, we would have seen it from our backyard, but we didn't. But still, the wind was so fierce, we went out the next day and were just picking up trash out of our yard, and we found some envelopes addressed to people in Tuscaloosa, in Birmingham, okay? That was pretty major things, okay? We went up to check the uh, place at Smith Lake that we have, and we had a friend of ours with us, and we drove by and that was before I-22 was open. There was a Swift or something like that truck leasing plant where they had the, the trailers for the tractor trailer trucks. I mean, it looked like someone had played dominoes with them. They were just tossed about. And it hadn't been a direct hit. This was just close by. Those things were just overturned on top of each other. You know, just an, I can't even imagine how much damage was there. And that was probably a category two or three that went through there. Just unbelievable. Okay, let's move on to hurricanes. Now, hurricanes start with some area of low pressure. Okay, now at three o'clock, we've got to stop. I'm trying to think. Why don't we start with hurricanes next time? Okay, because this does require some activity here. It's almost two pages, and I think to do a good job of it, we'll take a little bit more. I want uh, y'all to have plenty of time to work on the test, and I want to be able to get away to uh, get to the Birmingham campus uh, close to on time anyway.